the second most interesting man in the world. John John Macaluso, the third? Yes, man. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I wish way, it came with some more notoriety, but unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am the original Mr. 305. So there you go. <laughs> no notoriety either. Um, yeah, bro. Glad to see you. Glad to see you're you're healthy. You're doing good because I know you've been through hell and back um, yeah. in the last couple of years. And, um, you know, we get into that. But um, you reached out to me, wanted to talk about some issues um, you wanted to start up. And um, I said, man, let's just have a conversation because that's a lot. I mean, I did a lot of work over the weekend for you. Um, I did some marketing analysis and tech, took a look at what the competition is like and the market and, and all that. I, I, I really like your market, actually. Um, it's got a ton of potential. Um, so I, you know, if most people would say, oh, there's not a whole lot of money there, but there is, there, there's a lot of money around you, a lot of good competition too, right, yeah. right in your, in, in your house. And that's people are like, you know, pissed off about the competition. But to me, that's, I like it because that shows that there's potential or if not, they wouldn't be there. Uh, right. so, so that's to me, I mean, when I see that it, it compared to Miami though, that's not even competition, but, yeah. but it's there. Uh, so it's a good thing. So bro, just tell us about, cause I know you, you've been through a lot. We met back in the cemetery several years back. We've had yeah had little conversations um, back and forth. So what's been going on? I mean, for the last couple of years. Uh, well, just getting through treatment, dude. Um, yeah. you know, so I, most of you guys that know me from the sim, um, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer in 2018. Uh, and it really just, I mean, what do you, what do you do? Right. Like, I mean, I had to reassess literally every aspect of my life. It's been so difficult. Um, but the great thing is uh, because of a lot of the communities and a lot of guys that I've met in, in, in the pest industry, it just, so many people reached out. Um, you know, we, we had a, a family friend that was trying to help us do some things. And uh, we had some pretty big name, you know, people, man, in, in, in the industry, reach out to me and try to help and ask what right. we needed, which was really like, I, it's, it's a weird thing because I got into pest in 2002. And I, you know, I was just a technician, but um, working for different operators and, and, and seeing how, you know, corporate companies run from, you know, the, the family business type setting. Uh, I think at least for me anyway, uh, I gained a lot of respect for certain aspects, but also a lot of resentment for a lot of the way, you know, some of the companies were running and treating their guys and whatnot. And, uh, I don't know. I think at that point, like right before I found out I was sick, um, I was trying to make a decision like do i want to stay in this um you know is it really beneficial for me what has it done for my life and right. i was almost ready to just like get out everything just cut ties go back to school learn something different um and i think between you know the cancer stuff and and just talking with everybody and so many people trying to keep me boosted and and be positive it almost like reinvigorated me, man, while I was going through treatment. Right. And I think that's a big part of, you know, any illness anyway, is you have to have some positivity to, to kind of carrot string you, right? Like, that's what I was doing. I was going, okay, man, like, when I get through my next round of chemo, like, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And the ultimate goal was really like, I wanted to get well enough to go back to school, to take my certified operator, you know, to really just put my life in a place that it wasn't at before. And honestly, I don't think it would be if that would have never happened because it's complacency and it's just like the mundane, everybody gets in that kind of groove. And I, I'm not happy that that happened to me, but at the same time, a lot more positive came out of it than what I'd ever thought. So, um, yeah, thank God, because I mean, when you get that news, man, stage four, I mean, if it's stage one, you're saying, okay, you know, you're more positive. Yeah. I mean, but, even even like three, it's like, you know, the the statistical probability is is moderately in your favor with today's medicine. Right. Once you cross over into that line and and that was one of the strange things was like my my initial 
um, treatment plan, they put me on a clinical trial. And if I wouldn't have went to that, I don't think they would have found other things that I had going on. And so it was almost like a blessing in disguise that I got booted out of the clinical trial because I was now a stage four patient. So they kind of ramped me from, uh, you know, a, a standard care to a different treatment protocol that they don't do f- or they weren't doing back then anyway at my at my facility, which is Moffitt in Tampa. Um, and it, I mean, you know, knock on wood, brother, I'm still here. Uh, I think I've got one one more set of scans and, and blood work before they cut me loose and say, hey, bro, you're five years out. You're back in general population. Um, you know, I, I know I'm not that naive. I will still go to my primary care every six months. Like, yeah, just things you have to do. But in the meantime, right, this is kind of where all this came about. Um, I just wanted more, dude. I, I wanted more for me. I wanted more for my kids. I wanted more for my wife. Um, of course. And and that was it was such a big drive for me. And I didn't know what to do. And so, uh, you know, I did reach out to some other r- very close friends of mine. And everybody has their kind of tidbit and their info, but that's one thing I wanted to do was kind of reach out to, to you, because I mean, I was, dude, that's how I kind of initially met you was I started right. watching all your YouTube stuff and, and, you know, taking in all the info. Cause really at that time I couldn't find much information on, you know, uh, protocols and treatments and, and just everything, all the nitty gritty that I wasn't finding where I was working. Um, right. and it's kind of led me all to saying, Hey dude, uh, I think it's time for you to do your own thing. And I've seen so many people become successful and it just felt like every time I try to go after it, like something else would knock me back. And it was always something. And again, um, maybe that's a lot of personal excuses. And I mean, I'm not ashamed to say that, uh, again, be- prior to cancer, like I was just kind of going with the flow and trying to figure it out. And I mean, I'm going to be 40. So it wasn't like I was some, you know, 18 year old kid out here right. bumbling through life. Like I really was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and, and that's some of the negativity that comes along with it too. It's like you get online and you read and it's like, oh, bro, like it's too late. And it's like, what? You know, and so that's why I think nah, having, uh, having you know, access to all this information that we have today, because let's face it, like what you're doing, um, what some of the other groups are doing, they, those things just weren't there when I first started. And so right. it's been great uh, to tap into it, but also it's intimidating. Uh, because there's so much stuff and in these groups uh, you know you and I have talked about it in the past some of them I'm not going to say they're not focused on helping a single owner operator or somebody who's an upstart but there's definitely a huge push on you know get out there build your business hire guys and I'm sitting here like well what if I just want to be me <laughs> like yeah. what if I just want to keep it simple because one of the things that has always stuck with me was a a really great friend of mine told me one time I asked, I said, Hey man, if you could do something differently, uh, you know, what would you have done? And and he said, I like, the only thing I could say is I liked it when I was small because I felt invisible and I didn't like, there was no persona. There was you just went to work. You just did your thing. And you know, the amount of stress that I see some of my friends under uh, running these, these, businesses i just for me it's it's not what i want and so right. that's why i reached out to you because i'm like man frank i need some ideas man <laughs> like i don't want to get yeah. sucked into that because it seems like uh there there's just so much push and emphasis on oh yeah man get out there get a guy in a truck you know and who knows i'm not saying that's an impossibility i'm just saying right. that for right now a guy who hasn't been in the industry for almost five years because of health issues, I can't just jump right out here and go, you know, run 25 stops a day. Like it's not going to happen. And, and because of my cancer treatments and the surgeries that I've had, it's never going to happen like that for me. That's my physical uh, limitation. And and I'm okay with that, dude. So yeah, it's the reality. And, and, And I had to face that two years ago. Um, you know, as you know, most people don't know. I mean, some do, some don't. Uh, it, it depends how they follow me. Um, you know, I went through what you went through. I just went through it when I was 
10. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was six years of chemo. Uh, three. I mean, I was literally back then. I mean, this has gone so far, but every protocol I was on was a literally clinical trial. They were putting cocktails together. They had no clue in the 80s. Right. Of what was, you know, so when I went through it and and I went through my leukemia at, 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 a, at a as a child, I mean, I lost my entire childhood. I mean, it was all in hospitals. So yeah. I, I didn't know what a life was outside of a hospital until after 18. Yep. Um, and then I just decided I'm going to go to work because all I wanted to do was work and make money. Um, so to me, I get it. And then I just faced a new reality after 50 um, of where the, a lot of the stressors of personal problems took a toll on my health. It did. It just floored me. I mean, I went. I was running on adrenaline from the time I started my podcast and started my new business because this was a new business in 2014. Right to go all the way to 2020 right before COVID and dealing with three to four years of, of just personal stress and separations and, and then running at a hundred percent that stress with personal problems. It, my, my health just took a dive. My body just said, you got to stop. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't run a breaking a, point for everybody. Yeah. And that was my breaking point where I'd ran an adrenals for so long. And then I literally crashed and burned where I could not work more than one or two hours a day. Right. And then I would spend three to four days in bed from chronic fatigue. I yeah. mean, it, it was, and, it, and a lot it, of that too, is those treatments. That's just, that's the gift that keeps giving, right? Like it, that never really goes away for a lot of people. Um, no, a lot of, a lot of the chemicals that were given to me, a, a lot of the body pain I feel and, and muscles and, and cramps and things, um, at one point, I thought I had muscle atrophy and some nerve damage from it because um, the the chemos that were used cause a lot of nerve damage. Yeah, uh, it's a miracle that you know both of us are miracles that we're still here, um, <laughs> and 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 that gives us a renewed sense of purpose. This is why I'm relentless at what I do because I realize I know I have a purpose. Uh, I'm not left behind to just yeah. be average or whatever. But I'm one of those guys who just does push it, you know, and, you know, goes out there and hustles and, and, and does all that. And, and I had to learn to take a step back, reevaluate my life at 50. I had a reevaluation somewhere around 30, but at 50, uh, I can no longer do a lot of the things physically that I used to do at the same pace with the same intensity. You slow down. And, yeah. and, and what I can handle as far as stress today that I could have handled 10 years ago, it's nowhere near the stress I can handle. I mean, my, my stress levels, I'm keeping them intentionally low and managing that because it does take a toll on me physically. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's important, right? Is yeah. um, I was always, I don't know. I think you just get busy, um, especially when you're really young, right? You're just out there doing your thing. You don't think about, um, like, man, you know, you'd see your, your dad come in from work and he's just ragged. Like, I mean, yeah. I never thought about that until I got to a point in my life where I was like, wow, I mean, like it all does kind of catch up at some point, you know, it does. It does. It catches up to you. You know, the, a lot of the things that I worry about, a lot of these guys that I'm talking to that are at the high level, um, is the stress they went through because I saw their journey right? and, and I saw how their life was. Yeah. And, how, and how they didn't enjoy it um, because they were in that growth stage. Uh, when you're young and you're in your 20s and your 30s, um, and it has a lot of it has to do with pedigree. Mm -hmm. Some people have it. Some people don't. Um, you sacrifice a lot of things before you get married, before you have kids. And then you're supposed to be stable at that point. And then you can tend to your family and your kids. So, yeah, it's fine to burn the candle at both ends like I did when I was in my twenties running a store and having a business and having two businesses at the same time. Um, and, and, but I can no longer do that. I have to really, and then on top of that, you throw in my ADD, which is chronic for me. And you, you, you I really have to focus. And so now I'm a lot more focused, which is actually a good thing because a lot of, a lot of guys that I see out there in the groups, they think they're serial entrepreneurs. They're not. They're just yeah. maniacs because you're you're trying to run a landscape yourself 
and you're trying to do pest control and you're doing inspections and you're doing this and you're like, I'm burned out and you're saying you're burned out. I said, but I told you, you can't, you're not right. a serial entrepreneur when you're doing it all yourself. You're a serial entrepreneur when you own five businesses and they all run themselves. Yeah. yeah. Not when, and, not and when I, you're and, doing it yourself. I thought I was, right. and I wasn't because I was, I had a landscape division and I had a home care division and I had a pest control division and we had a pool service division. And, and, and a lot of times I had to juggle between, because if one of my guys was out, I had to go do it. Right. So, so I didn't own a business. I had a very good job that I worked at a lot of different things, but I didn't have a business. And, and I think that this either over glorification of the entrepreneur today is, is, is so romantic and yet so misunderstood and so um, romanticized yeah. that, that a lot of people, would want to be that and then they don't realize the price that their family has to pay that your and, kids and have i'll to say pay. this uh you know i watched my dad do that my whole life right build businesses and it was you know some were better than others he had a lot of fumbles um but he spent so much time you know worrying about like i gotta get this thing done or what you know and it and it took time away from us um yeah. And my dad recently passed away from uh, rapid onset ALS and, you know, seeing him go through that and obviously, you know, dealing with my own struggles, that's the biggest reason for me to push to, and I mean, I, I'm not trying to offend anybody because I, I do have a lot of friends that are in that kind of mode of just banging everything out when they can, but I'll say this if you're doing that and you're not enjoying something, right. why, why? Like, I just don't understand that. Um, yeah. With me it should with, be working for you, not against you. And yeah. that's what a lot of my friends wind up having issues with is, uh, you know, they're just not able to enjoy something. And I'm like, man, I've always felt like, Hey, you can go do something. You don't got to love it. You ain't got to like it. But as long as it, gives you enough to go do the things that you want to do somewhere else. That's okay. Right. right? right. Um, because like you were saying earlier, I think a lot of the, um, you know, there's a fallacy of just like, Oh, you gotta love everything and every day. And I, I just, I don't, that's not everybody, you know? And I think the people that do I, I don't think, that, I don't think it's realistic. Yeah. yeah I, I don't think, think the people that find those, that niche for them is, is they're very lucky and good for them. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I love what I do. Uh, I mean, but I'm not going to bed every night, like dreaming about, it. <laughs> you know, I think for me, yeah. I, I enjoy more of uh, just the interactions with, with people, you know, that's, that, that's probably the biggest thing for me. And that's another kind of driving uh, factor was just being able to be part of people's lives. And then when you leave it and they're still contacting you like years later, you're like, Oh wow. Like I never really realized the impact right. that you can have on other people. Um, and I don't think that's, trained a lot either uh you know in our industry right because for, for various reasons i'm sure uh, but just to know that like one little thing that you do a day could really change and impact somebody else's life years later i mean i'm seeing all that full circle now and it's stuff that i i just kind of brushed off in my earlier years but it really is true uh you got to do what you could do now um, and that's multifaceted, right? There's many aspects and angles of that, whatever it is for you. I think it's, it's easy to get lost and caught up in all the stuff going on and you can derail very quickly. And that's where I yeah. knew I wanted to stay in this just simply because I still had the drive. I still had the idea. I still yeah. had the want, even through all of this, right? It's something that coming out at the end of the tunnel, I wanted to do it. And I mean, I had people telling me not to. Oh, bro, like you had cancer. Why are you going to stay? It's like, dude, do, do I need to bring you all my genetic sheeting from, you know, a, a major NCIS hospital that'll show you that what happened to me has literally nothing to do with what I did for work? People don't care. Yeah. It's just yeah. their opinion and their attitude. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like I say, it's just a big deal for me. Uh, and I try to stay connected, especially through social media with, with everybody, with all of you guys, because right. it just meant more to me than, uh, you know, I am in a group and like I, I can get the little badge of, you know, <laughs> whatever they give you that much. Right. So, 
Yeah. It, it was more about friends and a lot of my friends here turned into family and I'm just so, so thankful for that. Uh, yeah. You know, there's some big, some big name guys, I man. I'm not going to mention them, but it's yeah. great people, you know, just yeah, some yeah. great people that we know. So, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of guys in this industry who are actually pretty big um, who don't show it because they don't have to brag about it. They have accomplished it. And, and a lot of those people reach out to me and, you know, they give me good advice and they see where I'm hustling and what I'm doing um, and what I'm about. Um, so I get a lot of good advice. I get a lot of good Intel uh, from people that have actually done it. And, and then there's those who are pretending to be something that they're not, they're not even close. It's like people thought I'm I'm this big huge company. I've always said I'm only two guys, three guys. You know, I've got <laughs> four, I got four or five people working for me um at at, at most uh at any time. Um and so I'm not this big company. I don't pretend to be. Um I, I just want to do this, a lot of this. Um, uh, you know, I, I I've been meditating over the weekend. Like I try not to do nothing on my weekends. Uh, sometimes I, it'll be a bed all day because I'm exhausted from the whole week. I've had a hell of a week um, out in the field, dealing with the office, dealing with the calls. I mean, I get 15 to 20 calls a day that I got to handle. Yeah. That's on top of the emails. That's on top of the text. That's, so that's 25, 30 communications a day Yeah. that I'm managing. Um, it takes a toll on you when you're, and then you're trying to be in the field and like my text say all the time, bro, that phone of yours is ringing every five minutes. I would lose my mind if I had to do tech work yeah. and answer all the questions. Now, you know how I feel when I got to go in the field and do it. Yeah. And, and that's like a big thing. I think when you're a tech and you're like, oh, hey, I want I'm just going to go out on my own. And and I mean, I was naive to it really until I got yeah. around a lot of you guys. I was like, whoa, I mean, you don't realize how much behind the scenes stuff has to go on, like just to get you in a truck to a house. So. Yeah. I mean, just yesterday, I mean, like I try to work the hours I, I, I try because I I don't do mornings very well for me. I, I get like I'm, ever since for the last two or three years, I wake up foggy head and that's part of the chronic fatigue. I'm usually more functional afternoon and I'm alert and I'm really engaged and then I can do the creative stuff and all the stuff I need to. So I go out in the field. I take care of a couple of problems. I come. So yesterday I was working on marketing and I was actually looking at your stuff in your area and, you know, analyzing that and saying, oh, this is, you know, this is a pretty neat market. It's weird market for me, but it's neat. <laughs> it's neat the way yeah. it's the way it's laid out. Um, and I said, definitely it could be done um, with no problem. But um, I was working on that and working on analytical stuff that I need to do for it. So I put in about four or five hours yesterday. Girlfriend's here working too. And she had to do some work and we did that. And then Saturday I did a little bit of work in the morning. And then I took, you know, the, the, the rest of the afternoon off to do nothing. Um, and I was battling this cold on top of that. So I'm like really stupid at points, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm incoherent. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, so, but this is how I function now and how I have to work where I can't, if you expect me to be somewhere at seven in the morning, I right. literally got, I literally got to really plan this out ahead that I got to wake up at six and I have to like, you know, not eat so late and all this stuff, you know, at 50 that you got to start doing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's been my life for like, well, I had, so I had surgery. Actually it's, it's coming up here soon is my anniversary date, but I had a, uh, you know, they took out like three feet of my colon. Like it was brutal, dude. But all that changes you. So like you have to start making incremental changes. And that's yeah, that's something that I I've had so much anxiety about. Uh, and after talking with you and kind of seeing that, hey, man, like it's OK to like pick and choose like when you go, when you do, you know, and I was just racked with anxiety because I felt like I'm going to be beholden to these appointments. Well, what if I can't run out of my house at six 30 in the morning? Like that, there's a lot of days that I can't do that. Right. right. Um, so it's, it's put a lot of uh, it's again, it's just put a lot of stress on me while I've been in this pre planning phase. Cause there were days where I was just like, I'm, I'm looking at stuff and I'm going, there's no way, like I, I can't do this. And then my wife actually said something to me. She was like, all these people that, you know, that, really do love you and care about you you don't think that they're not going to understand and i'm like well <laughs> some do um 
but that's the kind of relationship that I always built with people that I had done service for is it was very, uh, it, it was very much more personal, I think for me. Um, and, and when they know you're a human being and you have things going on, I, people are understanding. You just got to let them know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I did years ago, um, and I did this by intent from when I built this new company, I, I literally, you know, I've been doing pest control since 2006, but it was together merged with mostly lawn. And we, we were like 95% lawn because we did landscaping. We did pool. So we were out primarily an outdoor company. We rarely, I didn't do any GHP, general household pest. For those of you, GPC, for the ones that are listening to me, I only did lawn. And so therefore, when we got there, and when we did it, did not matter to the client because we didn't have any appointments for, for the long. I don't know what it was like to set an appointment. When I started this new company and I realized I had to do GPC, I set parameters in place to let the client know that when we do your service, we're primarily an outdoor company. And when we do an initial, we're always on a two hour window. Yeah. And, I, and I never set an appointment after 10 o'clock. In other words, my first appointment was between 10 and noon and then 12 to 2 and so on. And I put everybody on a two hour window and nobody I didn't have to explain to anybody why I couldn't do it at eight o'clock. We just don't have a spot available. Sure. And and I think so. And I mean, the sidetrack, but I had worked for a company where there just there were no expectations set. Right. right. So they allowed the customer base to just use them and drag them around like a doormat because their service was so bad, right? Yeah. They, they were like constantly, they were just so worried about bad reviews and people canceling. And it's just anytime that phone rang, didn't matter. Morning, noon, night, like boom, yeah. boom, boom. You're like, somebody is going to be there in 20 minutes. Like it was- It was then, unrealistic, yeah. And I, I thought that I, I was normal. I and then I started working at other places. I'm like, <laughs> Wow. Like that's a really, really stark contrast to, and, and I think, again, it really speaks to the beauty of uh, starting a business, right. And, and right. doing things for yourself is you have the capability of setting all that up in a way in which is beneficial. You know, obviously you're going to do the work, but for you personally, you're not out right. there killing yourself. And uh, again, I know my story is not unique in the fact that I've had, you know, some major health setbacks, neither is yours. But I think yeah. when you're out here working, a lot of people just can't do it anymore. Um, and they go on to, you know, to different things where some of us just seem to be a little more stubborn. Uh, well, I, I think we fell in love with the industry, which which is what I did. I fell in love with this, this job, um, with what it offered. Um, to me, it was because I've always been a geek of sort. I've always been the the chemistry guy. You know, I had a chemistry set when I was a kid. Uh, I've always loved tinkering with stuff. Um, to me, it offers that challenge that you, I, the, both from the business part, but also from the work part, but also the rewarding part. Uh, when we solve somebody's problem, because I'm a troubleshooter by nature, I think it, it appeals. And, and look, there's only 100 and at best, at best right now in the country. Um, there's only a hundred uh, the last number I saw was 134,000 technicians in the mm. country. Think about it. How many billions of people do we have? And there's only 134,000 compared that to it's five X for air conditioning. Mm. You know, there's like, I think a half a million air conditioning technicians in the country there compared to landscape technicians. There's a, a, a almost 500,000 landscape. Technicians. I mean, the pest control industry as a whole is very, very small part of this economy where there's only like, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistic, I think there's 87,000 that are registered technicians. I think the rest are the independents yeah. that haven't, haven't registered as, as, as labor, but there's not a lot of people in this industry. There's not a lot of competition. Um, I think there's one technician for every 2000 homes. Hmm. when you look at the numbers. So it, there's a lot of room um, and there's a lot of room for you to be you and not worry about anything anybody else is doing. Yeah. Because like, I know those guys that were, it was Sunday at 10 o'clock at night and they're still answering their phones frantic because 
people are calling and complaining that the technician <laughs> didn't show up, that how come you guys aren't there? How come nobody's answering the phone? And then the CSRs are telling the customer, yeah, the technician is going to be there in 20 minutes. And the right. technician is like 45 minutes away. He says, how do you expect me to do an initial and spend yeah. an hour with a client and then tell me and book all my appointments one hour apart and then tell the client I'm going to be there at a certain time? There's no way. It's, so what it's I, chaos. I mean, really? Yeah. You know? And 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 they're drinking and they're doing pot and they're doing anything they can just to cope. Yeah. And it's and it's nuts. And and I look at it by way, like my technicians, like right now, I have people calling me and like, when is the technician gonna be here? And I said, Well, he's gonna call you to schedule that appointment. The technician does that. But one of my technicians right now, he's in college, he's at a class, and I call him and say, Hey, listen, give me a call when you get a break. So we can talk about this account because we need to start this this week and this so we can plan it out because we're behind one or two days from last week from the hurricane. Yeah. And we're behind now. And these guys are wanting to know. But I give them the freedom to schedule all this. And I tell them sometimes I get mad at them for promising the client they're going to be there within an hour. And I said, you just did it to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because I told you, give them a two hour window. It's well, okay. You never know. I mean, stuff can happen. Um, it, it, but it does. I mean, this is Miami. I, yeah. Oh, <laughs> the traffic yeah. here is brutal. So I said, you do it to yourself when you give the client a specific time, when I'm giving you the freedom to give them a two-hour window. When Comcast, AT&T, and everybody else it's gives you- It's all day. It's a four-hour <laughs> yeah. window minimum here in Miami. My said, brother, Yeah, my brother works for Frontier, and it's like- th when you call, they're like, oh, we'll have a tech between eight and six. or It's like- because they just know, man, like you're going to get out to a house and like something's going to happen. You're going to find something. Yeah. It's not going to go as planned. And if you don't have that wiggle room, man, I, I feel like all of the really terrible things that I've seen uh, other people do right. is 90% of it. It's it's time. It's like, oh, I don't have time. So they just throw it out and whatever. And, and listen, like I'm not going to be that guy, but let's let's be real here. Like it just happens. Right. Um, and it winds up costing more money later because, Hey, guess what? You're going back there. And as a tech, if you never set that time space for yourself, which a lot of guys can't, and they're not allowed to, um, right. it's never going to get fixed. So then you've been to the same house, eight, nine, 10, ten whatever for service calls. And you're walking in the door. You think that person in there is happy? Like, Imagine being that guy getting like, up and seeing your schedule and being like, yeah. oh, Jesus, like it's, it's Mrs. Smith again. And like, yeah, like I, that's just something that I used to see so much. Um, yeah. We, we tell the really people, tough. people ask me, all the time, do you guys offer free reservice? And I said, listen, we, we can offer all the free reservices, but after we've reserviced your house for free three times and you've had to take time off from work, your the free reservice doesn't mean anything. I said, we want to solve it. And, and a lot of customers like right now we're turning down mm -hmm. because houses in Miami are in so much disrepair because of the rental market, 50% rental market. And people don't understand these owners don't want to put any money into these houses. We got homes that are in the Coral Gables area, which is, I mean, the, the minimum home, there's a million bucks yeah. for, for a 1500 square foot home, these old 1950 homes. And these landlords don't want to put two, $3,000 into exclusion work they're going to keep having the rodent and the issue and the roach problem. and they're renting these houses for six thousand dollars a month i'm not kidding you wow. yeah. i mean easy six thousand a month for these little homes in this ritzy place and they don't want to put the money in and i'm going in and going listen we're not going to take you on as a client because we realize it doesn't matter if you go monthly you're always going to have an experience and what you're looking at is you don't want to see that american cockroach in your bathroom and I, as long as you live here right now you're going to experience that and we can't take you on as a client. And I'm giving my text the freedom to go in and say, evaluate that house before you do it, do the inspection. And if you see that this is going to be a nightmare, you're not going to be able to do it. I'd rather you call me then and there and let me talk to the client and turn them down yeah. versus being the sales guy that I am and say, <laughs> I'm going to take on every account because we're going to spread it because the technicians are on production. Who the hell cares how many times they have to reservice it? When it's only 5%, but it's like we had one right now that the lady for two years, we had a contract. We did a contract with that house. And I told her, and I said, listen, you got to fix it for two years. She hasn't fixed it yet. She will go out and buy a $67,000 antique car 
because they're into that, but they won't fix the house yeah. and, and expecting us to come back every month for free. And I just finally told her, listen, you won't fix anything. The technician has told you, look at all these holes. I'm, and I'm not talking about like little gaps, nitpicking. I'm talking about a cat can fit through there. And she hasn't fixed it. And she says, I think we need to cancel the contract if you're not going to be able to solve this problem within the next week. I says, we've been trying for two years. You won't okay. do anything. I said, she just gave me the out. So I said, fine. Because I wasn't, you know, I said, no, we let's honor the contract. We signed it for two years. Let's just get through it till December. I'll let her know that we're not going to renew it and we'll be out of it. She called me and she gave me the way out. So because, but again, I could be salesman. And then it's it's that, John, it's that paranoia that you get into where now I have to be an IPM guy. Right. And then realize this is never going to work. Yeah. But, but it we takes need... a lot of strength, I think, and professionalism yeah. to approach those type of accounts where yeah. when you're new and fresh and green, you just have some guy pointing, go do this, go do, you know, I mean, um, at least yeah. that's, that's what it was for me. And then yeah. as I kind of slowly made my, my way in, I started to see what other people were doing and I'm like, wait, what? Like, this doesn't make sense. And right. it's really like you have somebody who, you know, they're not traditionally trained and they're training other people. <laughs> so like, it's, I mean, how many times have you heard it? It's like, you I mean, show I, up I, at, a, at a yard and some guy's like, Hey man, how do I mix this? And you got some guy in the back and he's like, Oh man, a couple of glugs. You know, it's like, there's, it's just crazy. And that's it, part of it is uh, yeah. I used to feel like, you have to say yes to everything all the time, um, you know, especially yeah. to customers. And then I realized, wow, my friends who are really are real professionals who take this career seriously, they don't do that all the time. Right. And you start to separate. And I think that's kind of what I started looking at people and being like, I want to be like that. You know, right. I want to learn. I want to be better at this. And right. That takes some, it does, it takes a lot of strength to, to say no. Um, and just to not appease where I think a right. lot of us were trained to just, yeah, go in there and just, you know, yes, 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 yeah. And Become a yes man. Yeah. And that yeah. doesn't, to me, kind of going back to what you said earlier about like troubleshooting and things, it takes away a lot of that really, because you're, you're just in this mode and it's very robotic and, um, I don't know. That's not something that I, that is really fun yeah. for me. It becomes um, a monster that you have to feed. And right. the problem is the monster is never, never satisfied. Stops. Yeah. And the monster is never I, satisfied. Yeah. I was probably 10 years in and I started understanding as well, acquisitioning and like, cause I'd be like, why, why did they just buy this little company? And, and I'm over there doing a service for $14 and it's like, nobody made money on this dude nobody and then you see that account come back up and another tech is going there it's like what are we doing and so yeah. there's just so many pieces to uh you know to these puzzles and i think really the whole point of this for me uh and reaching out to you was simplicity right just right. start it simple and keep it that way because yeah. i want the thing that i'm passionate about to allow me to do things that I want to do, especially things with my family um, that I've missed out on. And I feel like time is short, uh, you know, especially for someone who's been through some, some traumatic stuff. It, your mind doesn't revert back. And yeah. some people take that as, um, as arrogance, you know, some people take it as uh, you know, being impatient. And I'm like, Hey, <laughs> if you go, and you have a, a a calendar and on that calendar it says you got this many days, buddy. If you don't want it, if you don't change some way, shape or form, I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, uh, it's just something that I am not the same guy that I was before all this happened. And I'm You're okay not. with that. Yeah. Um, and that's, and, and, and a lot of the times that's a, 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 on a much deeper level. Yeah. More mature. I mean, mentally, spiritually, um, it, 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 it matures you to, to a certain level that other people can't appreciate the next day because they're living for today only. Yeah. And they, and they can't appreciate what they have today. Like wake up in the morning and, and say, I got to see my kids yeah. again. Yeah. 